Alright, today we're going to be talking about growth of trade and banking in the post-classical centuries, which will cover guilds, early capitalism, and a French merchant name, Zekia. To better understand what guilds are, I have to talk about what comes first, which is actually early capitalism, which then leads into why guilds were created. Now since you're so teeming to know what guilds are, I'll give you the wiki definition of guilds. That being, an association of artisans or merchants who control the practice of the craft in that particular town or area. As riveting as that was, we'll get to more interesting parts of guilds later. With the growth of agriculture came great steps and bounds in trade. Spearheaded by Italian business people, banking introduced to the West to facilitate long-distance exchange of money and goods. Banking operations became highly capitalistic as big merchants invested in boats and trips and voyages to get the goods to places in hopes for profit and as return. This new kind of profit making was not looked upon boundly by Christian thinkers such as Thomas Aquinas, who urged that all prices should just be kept just, reflecting only the labor put into the goods. You can clearly see how disturbing it is by this new profit making. Much to Christian thinkers' dismay, for wealthy Europeans were looking more into luxury goods, such as spices from Asia. Spices not only had preserving effects, but also kept the meat tasting good in a world filled with bacteria and flies and other horrible things that could get into meat. Cities in northern Germany and southern Scandinavia grouped together to form the Hanseatic League, which was actually created to protect the economic interests and diplomatic privileges in cities and countries along trade routes the merchants visited from the Hispanic League. So basically you had diplomatic protection and you encouraged trade even more. Hooray for capitalism. Also around this time, bankers were mainly Jewish business people who were valued for their services of monarchs and the papacy also could explain their ties to the common conception that Jewish people are good with money, which is talked about today. If by this time you're confused about what capitalism is, it's basically this. I have money. I want to make more money. I see you selling your pizzas over there to children for six dollars. I give you money, hoping that later on you'll make a large profit off of said children, and give me back money as return for my initial investment in you. That might not be the best example of what capitalism is, but it's kind of a fly-by description. Right now, I'd like to give a shout out to a figure in history who got a piece of his own page in this history book on page 227. A French merchant by the name of Jacques Cure. He was the son of a fur, he married a daughter of a royal family, and served as a tax official until he was caught minting coins with less valuable metals. He then founded a company that competed against the Italians and Spaniards in dealing with the Middle East. He then visited Damascus to buy spices, setting up a regular trade in rugs, Chinese silk, and Indonesian spices, and sugar. He also became a financial advisor and supplier to the French king and then was ennobled. With the largest fleet ever owned by a French subject, Cure surrounded himself with splendor and even arranged with the Pope to, for his 16-year-old son to become an archbishop. But he had his enemies. Many of the nobles in debt to him turned the king against him and had him tortured. Tortured, he admitted to various crimes, including supplying weapons to Muslims. Normally, he would be overlooked in most history books, but I'm kind of surprised he made his way into this one. Here's to you, Jacques. However, because he was a capitalist, he wouldn't have looked fondly upon guilds. So, yeah. And finally, after 3 minutes and 48 seconds of talking about capitalism, we are here at guilds. Now, guilds were formed due to the fact that capitalism was not yet the typical way of Western economics. Even aside from the moral qualms fostered by the Christian tradition, most peasants and landlords enmeshed in the market system. In cities, the dominant economic ethic stressed group protection, not profit making. So basically, they wanted to keep together and make the community thrive rather than one guy getting tons and tons and tons of money. Guilds group people in the same business or trade in a single city, sometimes in loose links to similar guilds in other cities. Here's a list of basically some of the guilds. 
apothecaries, armorers, brassers, bakers, barbers, uh, who are also surgeons and dentists, basket makers, blacksmiths, bowers, who made longbows, brewers, borderers, who made embroidery, butchers, carpenters, chandeliers, candle makers, cloth workers, cord wainers, workers in fine leather, cures, dress, uh, dressers of tanned leather, cutlers, dryers, farers, shoers of horses, fishmongers, <laughs> fishmongers, fletchers who make arrows, girdlers who make girdles and belts as clothing, goldsmiths, loiners, stirrups and other harnesses for horses, masons who of course build stuff, mercers, general merchants, needle makers who make needles that's it they don't make anything else just needles pattern makers who make wooden clog style footwear and plasterers who are plasterers <laughs> and plumbers guilds also try to limit their membership so that members had work if they had too many people then some of them wouldn't be able to work and get jobs done they also discourage new methods because of security and rough equality in an attempt to not maximize individual profit Guilds also guaranteed high quality purchases, so consumers wouldn't have to worry about shoddy quality on the part of some unscrupulous profit seeker. Presence saw the guilds as a way to raise themselves in society slightly. Guilds played an important political and social role in the cities, giving their members recognized status and often a voice in the city government. Guild statuses were in turn upheld by municipal law and often backed by the royal government as well. Capitalists, soon catching up to guilds, began realizing that low-quality merchandise was not going to be winning over anyone. So they started hiring artisans, usually Italian artisans, who would work at their home, alternating manufactured labor with agriculture. Their work was not guided by the motives of the guilds, but by the capitalists, who provided them with raw materials and then paid them for their production. They started to tell Europe's dependency on guilds and economically and started shifting towards commercialism and capitalism. Commercial and capitalism elements jolted against the slower pace of economic life in the countryside and even against the dominant groups of protection protectionism in most urban guilds. Most people remained peasants, but a minority escaped to the sea where they found more excitement, however also higher danger and disease. However, Medieval tradition held that if a serf managed to live for in a city for a year, then a day became a free person. A few prosperous capitalists flourished, but most people operated according to very different economic values, directed towards group welfare rather than the individual profit. Even though guilds started disappearing in the post-classical centuries, it still lives on today. So, how do guilds affect us today in the 21st century? Well, there's a new kind of form of guild. It is called a union. Modern unions are basically a group of workers who unite for the purpose of collective action, for many of the same reasons that guilds did. Unions negotiate with companies that hire their members to set wages, document conditions for firing, and determine rules about reserving work for union members. Unions have elected officials, similar to guild masters, and often run apprenticeship programs for those interested in trying out the work the union members do. Um, alright, this is a plot where the, uh, animation software I use, called Flash, kinda cuts out the, uh, audio, so I had to make a new audio track for the last part. Thank you for watching this part, and, um, the ending was just gonna be how guilds still affect us today as unions proceed forward trying to get equal wages for everyone so there's not that whole 1% 99% thing uh, thank you everyone for your time and uh, that's it here's the credits